Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and today I'm going to show you 20 incredible hidden details from Dune Part 2. Now this video is going to have some massive spoilers, so if you haven't watched the movie yet, then please do and then watch this video. Now I'm saving the best and my favorite detail for the last, and I humbly request you not to skip this video. Trust me, the details are going to be worth it. Now let me be the Lisan El Gaib and show you the way to 20 incredible hidden details from this film. Let's begin. Number 1. Right after the kiss between Chani and Paul, notice Chani can be seen using a piece of blue fabric as a headband. The director and writer Denis Villeneuve explained that when a Fremen woman fall in love, they wear blue in the film. And this blue cloth stands out against the mostly one color surroundings of Arrakis, creating a striking contrast. Number 2. This movie reveals how the Fremen ride sandworms and how they tame them. First, they use a thumper to attract a sandworm. Then, they have two grappling hooks ready on their hands. And once the worm gets close, they attach the hook to its mouth and gradually gains control over it. Now, let's go back to part one for a minute. Judge of the change, sire. Dr. Liet Kynes. Notice before Kynes was killed, she had two grappling hooks ready on her hands, and her posture was just like Chani's before riding a sandworm. So this confirms that Kynes was preparing to ride a sandworm in part 1 just before she got killed. Number 3. In this movie, we get to see Gady Prime, where the Harkonnens live during the daytime for the first time. Before this, we only saw it at nighttime in the first movie. Now the Black Sun is the reason the sequence when Fade Ratha fights the Atreides prisoners is filmed in black and white. And Denis explained that having sunlight kill color illustrated how nothing can flourish on this planet, not even color. And I find this truly amazing. I think this might be one of the best ways Hollywood has ever portrayed an alien planet and its people. Number 5. When Lady Jessica goes to the south, there's a noticeable change in the colors of her clothes and what the Reverend Mothers wear compared to the Bene Gesserit. Jessica and the Mothers in the south wear color like pale oranges and browns, which are like earthy tones. Well, the Bene Gesserets wear black. So this shift in color indicates that the Bene Gesserit has been divided into two sides now, one rooting for Paul and the other for the Emperor. Number 6. When Fade Ratha fights this prisoner in Gady Prime, he kills him using the same move that Paul Atreides uses to defeat him later in the movie. Fate pulls the prisoner towards him, only to stab him in the stomach. Now Paul pulling off the same move against him implies that Paul is a better fighter than Fade. Number 7. At the beginning of the movie, still Stilgar shows Lady Jessica how they extract water from the Harkonnen soldiers they've just killed. But by the end of the movie, the Fremen have abandoned their sacred beliefs to follow the Muad'Dib aka Paul, as we now see them simply burning bodies instead, because they now believe Arrakis will soon become a green paradise. So no need to extract and store water from dead bodies. Which brings me to my next detail number 8. The Fediakin burning the bodies at the end of the movie is also a callback to the opening moments of the film when we see the Harkonnen burning the bodies of the Atreides soldiers. So it's an eye for an eye type of a thing. As Paul Atreides said, he very much believes in revenge, unlike his late father. My father didn't believe in revenge. No, I do. Number 9. After Paul drinks the water of life, he tells Lady Jessica that he sees a narrow way through. I do see a way. There is a narrow way through. And that's when Paul gets a glimpse of all possible futures. Now notice there's a quick glimpse of the moment from later in the film when Paul stabs Fade Ratha during their combat. This goes to show that Paul really saw the future including Fade Ratha's death. And that's why Paul allowed himself to be stabbed and suffered serious injury. It's because he's luring Fade in and then guides Fade's knife to a non-fatal spot, making Fade think he's winning. But Paul pulls his tricks and stabs Fade with his Chris knife. Now this entire action is a callback to part 1, where Gurney allowed Paul to stab him in the shoulders, while Gurney would stab Paul back in the stomach. And that's exactly what Paul did to Fade. Number 10. This scene where Paul says there's a narrow way through has another hidden detail in it. Notice the first time Princess Irulan learned that Paul Atreides is alive, she and the Bene Gesserit were walking through a very narrow hallway. What if Paul Atreides were still alive? Enough! This must not come out. And the narrow way that Paul was talking about would require him to marry Princess Irulan to become the new emperor. So Paul's words are not just metaphorical here, but also quite literal. Because Princess Irulan does come out of a very narrow hallway. And that is incredible work from Denis. Number 11. The set called the Cave of Birds, which is shown when Fade Ratha comes to Arrakis to see the damage from bombing Siege Tabar, was designed to look like giant fingerprints symbolizing the identity of the Fremen. 
Number 12. When the Emperor interrogates the Baron, Raban, and Fate Ratha inside the Imperial tent, notice that the set is designed like a pyramid, with the Emperor, Princess Irulan, and the Reverend Mother at the top, while the Harkonnens standing at the bottom of the stairs. The producer Tanya Lapointe said that the Emperor sitting on the throne at the top is meant to symbolize how he's at the top of the food chain. Number 13. Now in the same scene in the Imperial tent, when Paul eventually kills the Baron and confronts the Emperor, notice their positions on the pyramid-like set are now changed. Now Paul is at the top while the Emperor, Princess Irulan and the Reverend Mother are at the bottom. This is meant to show the shift in political power in the Duneverse. Number 14. In part 1, during Paul's visions of the future, he foresees people fighting for him while holding flags that showcase the sigil for House Atreides with a dark background. However, in the actual battle scene in this film, the Fremen fighting for Paul are shown holding different flags. So this could be a minor continuity error there. Number 15. Dune Part 1 begins with Chani watching foreigners descend onto Arrakis to mine for spice. But the end of Dune Part 2 is the exact opposite. At the end of this film, she watches Paul and the Fedaikin leave Arrakis to fight the Great Houses and begin the Holy War. Number 16. Princess Irland's amazing metal headpieces were designed by costume designer Jacqueline West. She said they were inspired by how the nun's head coverings frame their faces. This allowed Irland to have some aspects of the Bene Gesserit without exactly copying their shape. Number 17. When Gurney Halleck appears for the first time in the film, he's playing the ballet set while singing, which his character often does in Frank Herbert's book. In the book, he's described as both a skilled weapons master and a musician. Number 18. The passage of time is shown through Princess Irulan's voiceovers as she records events and mentions the dates. The movie covers a period of nine months, which is shorter than the timeline in Frank Herbert's book, where the story unfolds over several years. This change also aligns with Lady Jessica's pregnancy. In the book, her daughter Alia is born during this time, but Denis chooses to keep Jessica pregnant and shows her having conversations with her unborn child instead. Number 19. The set design for Lady Fenring's bedroom was inspired by the idea of an egg held between the legs of a spider, and this was one of Denis' favorite sets from the film. Number 20. Now this one is my favorite hidden detail from the film. Ready for this? So let's go. Now a lot of people may not realize that Paul Atreides is not the same person after he drank the water of life. His skin gets even paler and he gets dark circles around his eyes. This shows how devastating the experience is as no male has survived it before, and it also makes his Harkonnen heritage more obvious. He becomes even more ruthless and starts wearing a black cape to show he's not much different from the Harkonnens at that point. Paul's black cape is the biggest visual clue that Paul has now embraced his Harkonnen ancestry. Before drinking the water, Paul never wore this cape. He always used to dress like the Fremen do, but after the water, everything changes and this black cape is the visual representation of that. I actually noticed it on my second viewing of the movie, where I was like, wait a second, why does Paul have a black cape now? And then I realized as soon as he came back from the dead after drinking the water, he came out a totally different person with a different outfit. And that's it. These are the 20 hidden details and easter eggs I've found watching Dune Part 2. Let me know if I missed any and comment down below your favorite detail from the film. Now if you like this video, then please give me a thumbs up, grab the subscribe button and turn notifications on. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter to get updates about my videos. Till then, I'm Kevin Hart, and I'll see you lads in the next one.